sports statement. Oh, and it sure was. The New York City Sanitation says, for, for anyone who finds this as treacherous, traitorous, and unforgivable as we do, just pretend it's green and white for New York's strongest. We take out the trash every day, and next year, that'll include the Eagles. Mark Gooden said, I'm here at the Empire State Building, where an angry mob of New Yorkers has descended. They are demanding the building lighting be changed uh, from green, and they want the person who tweeted fired. They were there demanding it right there. Empire State Building insurrection. Councilman Keith Powers in New York, he said, this is absolutely ridiculous. The New York Post said, if you are from New York, it was like watching your mortal enemy hit a winning Powerball ticket and then steal your wife. Wow. I don't know. Got to be careful with your buildings these days. Anyway, on the show today, I'm catching up with Black Rifle Coffee Company's Ben Ritchie. We're going to talk about bombs, coffee, beans, um, and his unique special forces military background. This guy's run marathons. He was in the Army for a decade. He was in special forces. He's run the supply chain over at Pepsi. He's done it over at Frito-Lay. Now he's at Black Rifle Coffee Company. We'll learn all about how that works and how they've made military part of their brand. They got a great story and a great YouTube channel. I don't know if you've been with it. It's got over, like... A million subscribers. Um, did you also know that there is only one parking spot for every 11 drivers in the U.S.? We have Truck Parking Club's founder, Evan Shelley, on. He's going to talk to us about how he plans to use tech and maybe a little real estate know-how and background to try and solve that problem. Plus, a boy playing hide-and-seek got trapped in a shipping container. We got doomsday clocks, how Costco milk bottles work, a uh, taking a big rig to a wedding reception, and a lot more. So let's tip the band. We'll get into the show. Did you know that AIT publishes a global transportation market report every month? So if your business needs information about air and ocean trends, carrier updates, economic forecasts, North American trucking, and customs clearance news, you can get all that and more in an easy to digest overview. Best of all, it's free to download. Latest one is out right now. Go over to AITWorldwide.com. But now, now, let's talk a little bit about truck parking with Evan Shelley, CEO and co-founder at Truck Parking Club. Hey, Evan, Chris Beer, CEO over at the ATA, he said that surveys show a severe lack of truck parking. He said more than 98% of drivers report problems finding safe parking, burning more than 56 minutes of available drive time every single day. To find it, they wasted the time. The wasted time amounts to over $5,500 in annual compensation. That's around a 12% pay cut. So I'm glad you're here so we can talk a little bit about this today. Evan, welcome. Uh, thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. I see I need to up my studio game. You a little. The, you got the, you got the. Where, where are you hanging out? Where's uh, where's like HQ? Where's your home base today? So I'm in Miami. My co-founder's in Atlanta. Um, so we're split between the two. But ultimately, you know, I think we'll be um, probably end up in Atlanta. Um, oh. But I'm down here in Miami. Uh, I, I was living down here before I started the company. And uh, you know the weather's the weather's good this time of year. Well, Evan, the company's pretty new, right? It's it's been for uh, a little over a quarter. It's been out sort of publicly. I was looking into your background here. How did the idea come together? You're sitting here in Florida. You talked to this guy over in Atlanta, and you're like, you know what? We got to do something about this truck parking. Yeah. So my co-founder um, is a huge owner of truck parking, uh, mostly throughout the southeast, um, but. You know, the reason I got into truck parking was a couple of years ago, I was doing a commercial real estate deal. I was looking at buying a piece of property and it was zoned industrial. And I thought, well, I'm going to put truck parking on here. I know there's demand in this area and it's zoned industrial. So let's do truck parking. Obvious, right? And I go to the municipality and the municipality says, no, we don't want truck parking here. And you're going to have a hard time getting it if you try. And I was like, that doesn't make sense to me if it's zoned industrial. So that was like May of 2021. And since then, I've really been studying truck parking, looking at it as an investment, looking at it. How do you fix this shortage, right? How do you create this supply? And then that led me down, you know, let's just develop. But then scaling development is such a slow, tedious process that takes expertise in every new municipality that scalability becomes quite a problem. So um, yeah. after meeting great people, just like my co-founder, um, Keith Crystal in Atlanta, um, you know, we talked and, and he had actually um, came up with a similar idea to the one I proposed to him. And uh, I said, well, let, let me grow this thing out and let's see if we can't make a dent 
you know, in this in this truck parking shortage by bringing more awareness to to properties throughout the U.S. Well, it needs it. I mean, Jason's law is about a decade old, a little over a decade old. I was reading an article in Overdrive last year, and I remember reading it. And I was like, what has the impact of Jason's law been? How has it changed parking? And um, I don't know if it's really done all that much. I know it's funded some studies and everything, but it seems like every week I see brand new stories about some community or some municipality banning truck drivers from parking, even in front of their own house, let alone parking where like they're out on the road. I'm talking about, especially in Georgia, where your co-founder is, there's been a number of stories in the past year of different communities. So Florida, too, said drivers yeah. in no way. Now, granted, there's been some HOAs, but for a driver, you saw that statistic. If they're losing, what, $5,500 a year. They're spending an extra hour just trying to park that truck. What have you learned so far when looking at this problem? Has it surprised you, the scope of it? Yeah, so I think that, you know, what you just said leads me back to, I think there was a tweet that went around a couple of weeks ago, um, the one, and that was in Miami, uh, where they were pulling over truckers, leaving this illegal truck parking facility and, oh, yeah. and treating the truckers like they were, you know, hauling drugs rather than hauling goods for everyone in the, in, you know, the South Florida community. And that, that kind of went viral between, I believe your tweet and my tweet and Craig Fuller's tweet, like, and people started realizing like that that's a little weird that you're treating these truckers like they're doing something wrong because they're just parking somewhere that has been deemed illegal by the municipality um evan hold on i want to talk about evan i want to talk about this story really quick because not everyone has sort of context on it but it was called operation lot lizard now for those of you familiar in the industry that would actually reflect term refers to actually sex driving refers to sex work in a parking lot um so they already gave it a really negative connotation like oh this isn't just a bunch about busting a bunch of truck drivers in this legal lot oh there's certainly all this illegal activity going on but i didn't really see any evidence like that in any of these stories how difficult is it to secure legal parking in America in 2023? What, what, what stands in the way when you go out and try and get lots? Yeah, I mean, it's become increasingly difficult, right? I mean, I, I don't know if you saw the um, other article that kind of went viral in Virginia where they shut down a rest stop that was a super popular rest stop, but it, uh, the state just decided to shut it down. Um, and you're, you're hearing more and more of those stories, you know, really daily. Um, and I don't know if people understand, especially politicians understand that when they do these things like shutting down a rest stop or busting illegal truck parking, um, they're, they're hurting everyone. So they're making truckers lives more difficult and they're getting hurt the most, but I'm, I promise you, your goods are getting more expensive every single time you bust one of these lots, instead of just working with that property owner to fix it from a municipality standpoint. And every time you pull over a trucker, you know, for being parked illegally uh, or even leaving an illegal parking lot and giving him a $300 ticket, that's going back to your cost of goods. So either don't complain about inflation or work with truckers, work with property owners to create an ecosystem where you appreciate and respect you know, the job of trucking and the job of supplying parking to trucking to really, um, you know, help the supply chain run more smoothly. Yeah, I, and I get it, and that's super, like, ideal, but what stands in the way? So, for example, in the United States of America, who owns the inventory? Who owns these truck parking lots, and why aren't they being developed is, is I, I understand you know you've talking about some of the rest stop owners you're talking about the government involvement here who are these participants that you have to go out to gotcha so the you know for the most part it's hyper fragmented the truck parking industry in particular i mean my, my partner is the largest owner of truck parking in the u.s and he has 70 locations mostly in the southeast so i mean that gives you an idea that it, i mean there's thousands of locations but most of the owners are going to be mom and pop people um that have one lot or maybe in our situation with truck parking club you know we're looking for um even people that don't know if they have property that's adequate for truck parking that maybe it's just an empty lot sitting there you know those lots can be used for truck parking um so you know it's very scattered to answer your question there's not one specific demographic you know or one specific type of person we're seeing you know all kinds of different people having properties that can be used for truck parking. 
Um, and, it, and it really just, it varies quite widely from a gravel lot all the way up to, you know, high secure electric fencing uh, type, type properties as well. So what does your site do? Is it like Airbnb for trucking or do you guys go out and get the lots? How does that work? Tell us a little bit about Truck Parking Club and the, the sort of business model behind that. Yeah, so it's a double-sided marketplace where we help truckers connect to property owners that have properties that are underutilized or not being used for truck parking. So we have people that will find Truck Parking Club and say, hey, I have this gravel lot. I think this will work for truck parking. I'd like to give it a try. Um, or we also have people that have existing parking facilities that maybe are underutilized. Um, and then we list them on the site. Uh, we're in 12, 13 states now, and we connect them with truckers throughout the U.S. that are looking either for, you know, a day, a few days, or monthly parking. Interesting. And what kind of feedback have you gotten so far in these past few months that it's been out? Are people booking lots? Are you finding people offering lots? How has that gone, gone for you? It's pretty incredible. Um, I think it shows that there's a need for this because – so we started getting listings early on and we weren't even advertising the site in the beginning because we were still working out the bugs and people were still finding the site and still booking online with no advertising. Um, you know, we had a lot in Adairsville, Georgia, and a lady was at a pilot up the street from our lot and she um wanted to drop her trailer for four days and obviously at a pilot you you can't really do that and she started freaking out because she wanted to drop her trailer and go get another load that she was going to make some money on and she was excited about so she she started googling around found us booked through the site reserved her space went and dropped her trailer and she left us a message to call her and i called her and she's like i really appreciate you know you had the ability to re reserve this site and i'm able to drop my trailer for a few days i need to run up to tennessee and get get this load, um, and I wouldn't be able to do that without the being able to reserve this site and me finding you on Google. And you know that I think showed us early on how badly there needs to be a central place for um, the ability to not just see truck parking, but reserve it and know it's going to be there. Oh, absolutely. I mean, when you're almost out of hours, too, a lot of drivers here running on a clock. They get, most drivers are running on a clock. They need some place to stop and rest their head. What kind of feedback have you gotten from drivers who have used it? And how are you getting this message out there to, to both participants since this is a dual-sided market? Yeah. So, you know, so far, so good. Uh, we do, you know, have developers on staff that continually work with the bugs that, that appear. But um, we, we have repeat users. We have people that have started using it since uh, December and are now continuing to use it at different locations. So, you know, so far so good. I don't think we need to create, you know, some deep tech AI platform to, you know, reserve parking, to help truckers reserve parking. But I do think we need an efficient, good experience that really caters to the trucker. And, and at this point, that's our... It's our main focus and um, we've gotten some good feedback and, and like I said we still have our bugs and we work through them um, and if you know any of the truckers out there have any issues we have a contact us page we have a phone number to call um, but you know we're constantly working out any types of bugs that may be on the site and um, mostly positive mostly positive feedback what are your ambitions like how big of a chunk of this problem do you think that you can address as you grow a service like this? We want to help solve the truck parking shortage. We want to be a huge part of that. And we believe it comes down to awareness of truck parking locations and finding underutilized supply in the U.S. It's out there, but is there awareness for it? And are the people that have this parking, do they even know that they can take that property and provide truck truck parking to truckers. Um, that's those are the two things that we're working on help helping to solve because we think we can get that fifty something minutes per parking down to the next interstate exit. That's how we want to think about it on every major interstate, rather than someone looking for fifty minutes and going to a pilot and a, a lot they saw on the side of the interstate and not finding any parking. 
We want them to be able to go to truckparkingclub.com and know that they have a location within you know X amount of minutes of them, and they know they can reserve parking, and they know it will be there. Um, how does I, I got to ask you something? How does your real estate background inform this? It seems like it's a pretty good background for getting into truck parking. You you're you're familiar with the availability of space and capacity and all those kind of things. Yeah, it, you know, I've been very lucky. Um, like I said, the reason I really looked into truck parking was because of a real estate deal that was going sideways and wasn't able to be developed for truck parking. Um, it, you know, I've, I've just been fortunate in my life to the things that interest me um, have kind of ended up tying together. Um, and it, it has helped me greatly um, because I can talk to a property owner and really tell them, hey, you're going to have an issue with your municipality here. Hey, we think this is good for truck parking. We've looked into your zone and we've looked and understand the dynamics of the area. And we think this is going to work. Um, and then, you know, my co-founder as well just has a deep background in, in real estate and truck parking. So, you know, we've been very fortunate um, to be able to have those skills to apply to growing out this business. What do you have to say to like the NIMBYs out there who don't want truck parking in their backyard or their municipality? Uh, I, I would say... You know, I would say I understand in some situations why people don't want truck parking right beside them. Um, but I also would say that if there's a truck parking lot that isn't affecting you in any material way, and you just get curious and think it's a great idea to call your municipality and do something like what happened in South Florida, I hope you know that that's coming back to hurt you just as much as everyone else that you impacted through cost of goods and that you're ultimately you're affecting the supply chain. And when you're mad that your iPhone costs a hundred more dollars, well, you're, you're contributing to that. You're contributing to those issues. And the job for truckers is already tough enough that why make it even harder on truckers? Um, you know, Keep that in mind before you, you know, call call in a, a truck parking lot because you don't like the way it looks. You know, it's not a you know it's not the prettiest profession in the world, but it is extremely important. It is a very important part of the supply chain in America and keeping America running. So. Uh, I would just say NIMBYs keep that in mind as, as you're trying not to go out there and impress your HOA and impress your neighbors by getting something shut down. Really, you know, put yourself in the trucker's perspective and in the, in the, truck, the truck parking owner's perspective. And maybe there's ways that you can create buffers or things of that nature that you won't even know that there's, there's a trucker, you know, even around you. Um, Evan, I mean, that, that's what I would say. One of the best things about, especially the early start of doing a site is you really get to use, know your users, right? There's, there's, you don't have a million people yet, so it's pretty easy to tell who's who. H have you gotten any good stories yet from a driver who you've really helped out? They, they were put out for the night, they couldn't do anything about it, and they found your site, and, um, and you made their day or you made their evening? Yeah, I mean, the one uh, that I mentioned with the pilot is yeah. one that really stuck to me. Um, I was just like, wow, we're really making a difference. But also, you know, I've created relationships with these people to where, uh, you know, they'll, they'll go book a space on the site. And we're small enough now where I'll just go call them and talk to them. And like, what are you thinking? And I've got a couple guys that after I called them on my cell phone, now they call me. And they want to chat and talk and they're like, hey, you got something over there in, uh, you know, Powder Springs, Georgia or uh, something like that. Um, and, and that's cool, you know, like really because they, they don't currently have that. Yeah. Right. They, you know, there are certain apps and things out there that do certain features, but to know that you can go and reserve that. Oh, yeah, there's, you know, there's seven spots available here tonight. You want one? Yeah, I want one. Okay, we'll reserve that spot for you. Um, you know, I think there's some value in that. And I think people appreciate that. Um, and I, I, I would just say, 
you know, we're, we really want to focus on customer service and trust and, and building a great relationship with our customers. Well, everybody out there, go start building that relationship at truckparkingclub.com. You go reserve your spots. You got a spot. You want to start making some money now? Put it out there for the truck drivers, and your iPhone won't cost $100 more. Evan, thank you so much. Best of luck yeah. this year. Are you, are you going to be in Vegas tomorrow? You said you might go. Yeah, yeah, I, I did book a last minute trip, so I'll see you there. Okay, I'll see you out at uh, Caesars. I, I get in really late tonight, so I'll uh, catch okay. you tomorrow. <laughs> I'm probably going to get yeah, some sleep the second tomorrow. I land. Take it easy, Evan. Appreciate your time. Awesome. All Thanks, right. Dinner. Bye. Good time. All right, get some drivers some spots. Go to truckparkingclub.com. You can sign up over there. Very simple site. You're not going to get confused. Meanwhile, I think the number one thing that I hear during the wintertime being an operator on some of these jobs is, Oh, it must be nice to sit in that warm cab all day. Uh, it is, actually. Should have picked a different trade. I think the number one thing that I hear during the wintertime being an operator on some of these jobs is, do you remember when AIT's Global Transformation Market Report earlier in the show, capacity and pricing trends, air, ocean, and trucking, economic insights, et cetera, et cetera. Well, what do you do once you have that useful data analysis? You turn insight into action. Partner with AIT's global network of subject matter experts, and they'll design a supply chain solution tailored to your very needs. Get started over at AITWorldwide.com. But you know what I like? I like a nice stiff cup of coffee. Let's take a little look at this company we're about to talk to roll the tape war gets easier when you commit to death evan hafer a former green beret founded this company seven years ago four years ago you were already talking about this incredible growth story right. in black rifle coffee now you're going to go public business gets easier when you commit to everything short of death to success the pouches that are in my shadow box behind my desk I was sold everything. So these tactical pouches I collected over the course of you know, decades of service, like these things were owned by me. I was selling them on eBay and just dumping all my kit because I was trying to fund the growth of the company. And I have a few left. So I put them in a shadow box and I put them up as a reminder that you always have more shit to sell. <laughs> you can always give more. And if you stop short, you're gonna regret it. Once I realized that, I was like, oh, I'll be all right. Yeah, I'll succeed, I, I got it. since Red Bull that knows their audience better than this one. I mean, you go to their YouTube page, you look at their marketing. It is so specific. And, and the funny thing is, it barely even talks about coffee. It's all about the lifestyle and who that actual drinker is. Ben Ritchie, I have so much to talk to you about. He's Senior Director, Distribution and Transportation over at Black Rifle Coffee Company. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, man. It's great to be here. I, lo I, love, the, I love the video you shared. It's awesome stuff. I, I, that's that's your that's all your company. I um you know I'm yeah. a big fan of like war games and war movies and I've been and YouTube has so much great content and recently you know how YouTube will just send you on rabbit holes. You watch like the Battle of Karnov or something and they're gonna they're going to sh they're gonna suggest something else. Well, I got some Black Rifle Coffee Company stories in there. I didn't even realize they were from a coffee company at first. That's how well produced these videos and these stories that war are. You your your team does an amazing job. I didn't learn anything about coffee you but i was like this company gets it yeah it, look um evan hafer and matt best um when they i think when they started this company that that's probably what punctuated the really the beginning of it is what a great job what a great job they did and just send, sending the message of who the company is and what the company stands for really why i'm so excited to to be here and get have a chance have the, the honor and the opportunity to to um to drive this business forward um uh, you know, the uh, conservative coming out of the closet will always be my favorite one just for anyone to watch. That's, that's <laughs> in my, for my, for my money, that's the very best one, but there's hundreds, there's hundreds of great ones out there. And, um, you know, I just listen, I, I love listening to Evan 
in, in some of those uh, earlier videos and, and recent, more recent going public, like you're just showing, um, just talking about the company and talking about its philosophy because it's um, it's just awesome. It's awesome to be a part of it. It's not cosplay either. I mean, these these are legit from the founder of your company, who is the Green Beret, down to yourself, who was in the Army for a decade, as well as Special Forces. Let's talk about you for a second here, because you bring the mold into that business from the logistics side. Tell me about your background in the in the military, a decade in the Army, pretty, pretty long tenure. Yeah, um, well, I, I'm a 98 West Point grad. I started out in uh, the field artillery in, in Germany, firing rockets into into the middle of Grafenbeer training area. And I too, at, like, like our founder and CEO, decided that I wanted to do um, s something a little bit different. I went to Special Forces Selection to become a Green Bray as well. Um, and I, I happened to be in the, the uh, September, I went into selection on September 10th, 2001. So, when we were out there at Camp McCall and, and all the, everything was happening out in the world, we actually didn't know and got briefed on it that evening and were basically told, you know, uh, for those of you who stay uh, you, and, and get selected and become Green Braves, you'll be going, you'll be going to war. And, and I'll tell you, nobody left. <laughs> nobody walked out the door. It became a very competitive class and uh, blessed and lucky to have gotten uh, selected and also uh, then going through all the training and become a Green Beret. I uh, then joined uh, the 10th Special Forces Group in Fort Carson, Colorado, um, and that was, you know, the rest of my tenure in the Army was there for about five years, uh, a couple tours in Iraq, a couple tours in other parts of the Middle East, um, had a, a lot of really amazing um, ex life experiences in, in, in those jobs. Um, and But at the end of my team command, I decided to go do some different things, and that sort of began my uh, logistics career after, after that. Let me let me ask you about that. So Green Beret training, for example, how is that as challenging as it sounds in my head? I, I, I see some of the videos like this is what they have to go through. But you don't get cold when you're watching those videos and you don't get stressed and you don't get tired. You don't have anyone screaming at you. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's it, it is uh, is intentionally stressful. Right. Um, you, you know, there's a there used to be a really great uh I guess hour long video called three weeks in hell, which is uh, sort of chronicling um, candidates going through so the selection, just the three week selection, which is um, it, its own test and, you know, uh, you, its own weighing and measuring of, you know, uh, who's going to get selected to go on to training and then training, depending on your, your MLS or the skill set you're going to get trained in or the job you're going to get trained in uh, is anywhere from six months to another year. Um, so, yes, you are made intentionally cold, uh, hungry, tired, stressed um, to, to the max that they can to because, frankly, I mean, in that environment, um, you know, in, in large part, a lot of our logistics environments, too, right? We, we need the, the United States Army and the United States Army Special Forces needs folks who aren't going to quit when things get really hard. That's the that's the, the main thing. I mean, I. I, I still remember back to selection, especially being a, a, a Green Beret and leading Green Berets. Um, you know, the, the, hardly any of them look like uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger in one of his movies where he plays a Green Beret um, or Special Forces Commando or Operator. That was one of the movies, Commando, right? Um, the, the regular folks like like me, like Evan, uh, who, who um, just really are dedicated to the mission, dedicated to their country, and uh, also are willing to go, you know, um, to great lengths to to defend to the defend the Constitution, defend the country. So uh, that's what they're looking for. So they make you intentionally very uncomfortable to make sure you want it. Well, I mean, look, the military is a massive logistics operation. You're moving everything from bombs to food for entire armies and equipment. Did you start realizing that and taking an interest in that while you were in the military, or was it when you got to the private sector? Well, you know, interestingly, when I got to the private sector, I, I realized that what I'd gotten really good at, <laughs> and I shouldn't admit this as a Green Beret, wasn't really kicking doors in and doing all the really cool uh, <laughs> stuff you might see in a movie. It was actually getting the beans and the bullets and, and everything else that my team needed to be successful to them. Uh, vehicles, uh, fuel, uh, all, all of, again, uh, you know, everything that not only my team, but uh, our, our friends and country, everything that they would need uh, to be successful in their missions. And that's logistics. I was doing a lot of logistics and I was getting really good at it uh, and sort of didn't know that that was happening. Uh, so then, you know, I went 
got out, went to school, and started uh, and started working at Amazon, and realized not only not only had I had a lot of experience in logistics, but I actually really enjoyed it and was just getting better and better at it. And so um, uh, that's that's how it all started. It did, actually did start in the military, uh, my military career. Kind of at the time, I could say unbeknownst to me, it was uh, a muscle that I was really growing while I was doing that job. What's a harder supply chain, the, the U.S. armies or Pepsi's or, or Black Rifles or, or Frito-Lay's you've, or Amazon's? You've been in some big places. That, that's a really good question. Um, well, you know, supply chain has its challenges no matter where you're at. Um, <laughs> I, would, I would say the armies is probably the most challenging, uh, but, but you also probably, I, I think we had a lot of latitude in how we got what we needed uh, often. So, um, from a controls and compliance perspective, that's that's always a consideration. But I would say, you know, in the United States Army, that's a that's a global supply chain. Things tend to move a little slower. Sometimes I can still remember waiting on uh, uh, containers, connexes to get you know get to us from from the United States when we we're uh, across the pond in Iraq. Sometimes, and so that and that was my introduction to how supply chain works and how just in time works. And sometimes you gotta uh, make the phone calls back to the right right uh, organization or function or people to, to make things move a little faster. Um, Pe PepsiCo, I'll tell you what, um, PepsiCo has an amazing supply chain. Uh, they've got a lot of uh, really great people leading uh, what is a vast supply chain. And I think that um, that organization that I spent 10 years at um, has invested a lot of time, effort, energy, and money into a great uh, global team and a lot of great global processes. And frankly, that's what uh, Black Rifle Coffee Company with its mission, what I really wanted to bring bring to the table is all that, that experience that I got to um, to be a part of and uh, bring it over bring it over to, to a great coffee company. What, what's the biggest difference between the private sector and, uh, and the, I'm sure there's a lot, but between the military side and private? Um, boy, there, there's, there's so many. Well, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, uh, uh, you know, the private sector, of course, we're worried about the bottom. We're mostly worried about the bottom line. I would say yeah. the biggest difference, right, in, in my during my military career, the, doing the things I was talking about, besides kicking the doors in, but moving the beans and the bullets, and um, you know, accomplishing the mission, uh, we didn't have to worry as much about the bottom line. If we needed something, we could go and find it. Um, then you still have to be cost conscious, but not as much so, uh, because really. To be fair in that environment, if it's something you need to to, to make sure you're protecting your your folks or your um, your indigenous partners, et cetera, um, the the financial cost isn't as much of a consideration. It's a you know in that case it's basically an emergency. You're going to spend what you need to to get what you need. Uh, in in the civilian world, that's not the case. We're not. This isn't hearts and livers, and this isn't beans, and especially not. It's most of the time unless you work for a. a company that makes bullets it's not beans and bullets um so you, you know it's much more uh, much more co cost conscious uh you know much more productivity conscious and um thinking about all the ways of course just like any other cpg company that we can that we can save money be more efficient be faster um and really serve over service our customers while saving money at the same time that's that's the biggest difference probably how does BRCC's supply chain work? As I mentioned at the top, you guys aren't just coffee beans. I was looking at the site. You have a ton of apparel and a ton of different gear as well. So, I mean, this is a pretty comprehensive company that you guys have built over here. Yeah, what what, what uh, Evan and Matt and the team built is really amazing. It's true omni-channel. So, uh, you know, I, I'm responsible for um, uh, for logistics and su supply chain for um Direct to consumer, our direct to consumer businesses, which is really what the company grew up on. Uh, but now also, you know, um, I'm sure you know, most people know that we're in Walmart now. So our business, our B2B, our business to business is growing exponentially now. And that's changed the dynamics for me, right? For my team, uh, because we've gone from largely parcel, largely D2C, largely e com to um, over the road. So our truckload or LTL is growing at a much faster rate now as we're grow, uh, growing much more into B2B, we're also adding what we call outposts. Those are our, uh, our stores um, that we're, we're gonna have a lot of them in Texas. I think we're up to about 35 now, and I think we're supposed to be about 70 by the end of the year. Um, hopefully that number's, that number's right, but uh, we have a great 
um, chief retail officer who's got a lot of great experience, who's um, growing that the right way across um, across the country at this point. And so I've got th that channel. Um, and then our ready to drink, uh, our cappuccino in the can is really mostly going to uh, distributors, uh, beverage distributors all over the country. So that is growing. I mean, we just turn on region after region. I think that business is going to grow about double this year. So again, and that's what a lar largely that and Walmart and some of the other B2B is what's driving our over the road, uh, really growing exponentially while our D2C um, is still growing, but not, not quite at the same clip. What's been the learning curve for that? Because when you're talking about direct to consumer, that's a lot different than retail. And that's a lot different than distributors too. You've got three pretty unique categories that you'd have that you have to go into all with different needs that they need addressed and all with different things that will set them off if they're not met. Yeah, um, it, it's it's definitely what, what I love about it is, is how dynamic it is. And I mean, it um, it's really an environment where we have to look for for partners who are who are nimble, who are going to be able to grow with us, who are, who are frankly going to be able to help us grow um, and who are going to uh, offer multiple solutions. So, I mean, if I'm looking at a carrier, I'm looking at that carrier thinking, um, are they going to give me a great rate? Uh, or, or are they going to give, give me great service at, at a reasonable rate, but also do they have any warehouse uh, capability? Do they have, are they able to deliver to the ground? Do they have their own assets? Are they just brokers? Do they have their own assets? And are they able to, um, so what other capabilities are they able to bring to the table? Because I, I have all kinds of delivery from doorstep to regular dock to, to uh, deliver to the ground to our stores. Um, and I've got, and we've got a fast growing um, warehouse network as well. So when I look at partners, I'm looking at that nimbleness, that ability, and that ability to help Black Rifle Coffee Company get where we already know we're going, but we may not have all the, all the physical assets in place yet to, to do everything that we need to do. So partnering with uh, organizations that can help us do that is extremely important, for, is extremely important to us. When you get a bad rate, do you drop the green beret card on them? Yeah, you know. Just... <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I just I just tell them like, <laughs> what, what, what do you think this is? Come into my, please come and step into my office because we're gonna have to have a pretty serious conversation <laughs> at this point. And then, you know, then I start, I lean back and I let them know what's up. You know, there's some uh, daggers and stuff up there. No, I um, I try not to do that. But, but yeah, that's a good, it's a good option though. It's a good option. Well, what are you seeing right now? What what trends are you seeing in transportation? How does the start of twenty twenty three look in these categories? Um, well, you know, I, I'm I'm seeing what uh, what everybody's seeing. So we've got you know uh, volumes down, um, rejections are down, rates are down. What what what's not to like about this market if you're if you're a shipper? <laughs> um, it, you know, I I I tend to as we talked about a little bit at the at the girls panel. Couple of weeks ago, um, I, I tend to look. I tend to try to look three, six, nine, if I can, twelve months into the future. And I mean, uh, you know, shameless plug for your product. That's why I use Sonar so much, um, because while while it's great to see these trends that you know, um, and, and as a shipper, you know, we, we've got a lot more rate leverage right now. Um, I, I don't I'm trying to figure out how long is this going to last and what does that that U shaped curve really look like as it's come down, you know, gotten looser from um, the beginning of 2022 into you know the remainder of 22 and then as we're coming into 23, what's interesting is if you look year over year at that um, uh, outbound tender rejection index curve. I mean, from the beginning of from the beginning of COVID, you've got this really um, pronounced U shape, right, of, of uh, loosening and then tightening. And then, then you look year over year and it sort of does the same thing, but, oh, but much at a much uh, tighter market. And it sort of meanders and does this other uh, year long U shape. And now we're in another, what looks like another almost maybe 18 to two months to two years U shape uh, of loosening. It's going to stay loose for a while and then tighten again. Um, but I, I, I also believe that there's other things going on, especially when you look at geo geopolitics and everything that's going on in the world that are going to have a lot of downstream effects where that U-shape in this case might get truncated. We might see uh, tightening and rejections increase exponentially really fast and to greater magnitude. 
um, in the middle of the year. I, I think I'm kind of with everyone as far as, uh, yeah, the middle of the year, we're going to see some changes happening. Um, based on just the bull whips we've seen over the last couple of years and um, everything that's going on in the world right now, not only in the world, but then, of course, in, in our own um in our own economy with credit card use versus savings, uh, real expenditures versus uh, uh, real income, you start looking at those, um, the gaps in those curves and it starts to, and then actually the, the, uh, the increase in, there's a little small decrease in price of commodities, but I'm looking at fuel and I'm like, wow, if that alludes to other commodities starting to get more expensive, like fuel is sometime in the middle of the year, this is why you know I'm looking at those trends and I'm thinking this is great right now as a shipper. Don't think it's going to last very long. Uh, I, I think we're looking at I think we're going to looking at some 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 changes, some pretty significant changes happening in the middle of the year. I hope I'm wrong. I, I want to I, I want I want the I want the tightness to just sort of meander uh, up and sort of like take its time to the end of 2023 and for us to have time to react to it and plan and everything. But. Um, yeah. Did you guys get stuck with uh, like? In, did you were you part of that theme that that was last year getting stuck with like an ass load of inventory, or did you were you guys kind of immune to that? Um, we had a little bit more than than we than we wanted to, but th that that really wasn't based on the market. You know, I, I think we we talk a lot about all these trends, like like I was just saying, credit card usage, savings, and everything like that. For us, um, it was just because we are growing so fast and we've turned on so much. Uh, manufacturing, co-manufacturing specifically for both coffee and our ready-to-drink products that um, we've just been making it so fast and trying to level our inventory across the country that, um, and we don't necessarily have, a, you know, the best systems, uh, you know, like WMS type of systems in place yet to help us do that, that we did end up with a little bit more inventory than we probably would have liked, but we're uh, we're really in a pretty good position now from an inventory perspective. Um, I spend a lot, my, my team and I spend a lot of our time figuring out, you know, how to level the inventory now that we do have it. And frankly, to be honest, it's it's nice to have it. It's nice to have the inventory because the demand, especially for that ready to drink, especially for that cappuccino in the can, which we've just started, uh, we just uh, launched two new, three new flavor, two new flavors. We got a third one coming out sometime uh, balance of this year. Uh, but that vanilla bomb and that uh, uh, vanilla, uh, sorry, uh, um, the caramel flavor, the new caramel flavor that's come out um, to go with our core set of SKUs is just is just going crazy. So um, with sales, so um, it's great to have the inventory. Uh, we're just getting into the rhythm of, you know, as I'm used to at a PepsiCo where it's like you have your normal rhythm of demand and you're, you've got behind that your normal rhythm of production and everything sort of works. We're still figuring out that normal rhythm and that normal cadence. So um, we're in a great, we're in a great place for inventory right now. Well, one thing that I mentioned here was one of the ways that you put this out to market is in your media. You've got over a million subscribers on YouTube. And if you like immersive, uh, like, war stories going right into the battlefield, people talking about what happened to them, I mean, this is a channel for you. You mentioned there's also some humor on there, too, like conservative um, coming out of the closet and those kind of things. I was curious, do you have, like, a full production studio over at, at headquarters over there? Um. There are a couple of uh, places where they do uh, a lot of that stuff. Through. So it's, I think it's similar to the Freightwave studio, not quite as um, built out, but there's a, a, an area in San Antonio they use for that. And then there's, there's another one in Salt Lake city, excuse me. Um, th these are, and then I think, uh, you know, I think between Matt Best and, um, um, and JT, they, they manage and run a lot of that. A lot of the production um, but they do an amazing an amazing job of it so it's very again very similar to what i think you all have set up where um it's very intelligently set up uh you may, and maybe not the biggest of space but it um do a fantastic job of of uh, making it look bigger no I, it, it is really cool i love that i'm a i'm a big battlefield player so i, I like the veterans react to this uh the first person shooter game over here the one thing i want to ask you before we run out of time here though is i know you're also an ultra marathoner so you've done a uh, not only a green beret but you really still challenge yourself to this day and i was curious what has that taught you about business how has that made you a good transportation leader Oh, wow. Well, you know, what's interesting is uh, I think I gravitated to that sport because it is um, it's a great question because it is so much like logistics. It's so much 
it's um, it's sort of a metaphor for all the challenges that we have. Um, I actually was sharing this with um, with some of my teammates um, sometime last year that th there's the parallels are, <clears throat> you know, in in ultra marathons, just like in logistics, you could say just like in life, uh, you got to have a plan. You know, in, in ultra marathons, it's you got to have uh, your food, your water, your rest plan, your drop bags and all that kind of stuff. And in, in, in logistics, you got to have a, a, an annual operating plan. You got to have great partners, great tools to use. You got to got to have a great team, got to be able to rely on your team um, in ultra marathons. I mean, those you don't do those alone for those that haven't run an ultra marathon. You don't you don't go 100 miles without uh, a great team of support. Um, who's going to, and then and probably pace her for the last uh, 25 to 50 miles. You, it's, it's never done alone. You got to have a great team. You got to bring the right tools. So your hydration system, whatever it is in a race, similar to TMS, WMS, sonar, uh, you got to have the right tools, tools to be successful. Um, got to be mentally tough. So this is, you know, I ch I've chosen this sport to keep, you know, force myself, put something on the calendar to, to make sure that we're, we're staying in that space of being mentally tough keeping a never quit attitude, same as logistics. And then, you know, one of the big ones, you could do all that stuff and still be um, struggling for whatever reason. The last part is always to take calculated risks. That's one of the things I love about, um, <clears throat> about ultras and it's the same in logistics. And, and again, the same in life is um, recognizing those opportunities uh, to, to take a calculated risk, um, to, to take a chance on whether it's a, a person or a technique or a mechanism or a system, um, invest in something that's going to pay back. Um, it, it's a great, uh, so doing ultras is a great metaphor for how all that works, but. I, I'm not yeah. sure if, uh, how, wait, how long is this? Are we, we're talking over a hundred miles here for one of these? Yes. Um, and you run that in um, one go, uh, you, do you have to do that in one, like one full go? All in one. They give you more than a day, though. They give you about thirty hours. So, Man, what do your feet look uh, like after? What do your feet look like at the end of this thing? Because I've seen people's like I'm from Boston. Yeah. I see people do the Boston Marathon, and I've seen like in the news they always show gross pictures of people's feet peeling. It, it's they're bloody stumps. <laughs> they're bloody stumps by the end. They're bloody stumps by the end. But you know, and here's here's the thing too. Like it, it also is a reminder for for me as a as an ex Green Beret and as as a member of a great company that supports veterans it's a reminder of that we always have to be pushing ourselves i wanted to make sure that i that i shared too you know we, we talked at the beginning about um what is black rifle coffee company um and i talked a lot about evan and matt and the great productions and the the great pro we've talked a lot about the great products just want to be uh sharing too that um black rifle coffee company exists to support veterans and their families and first responders and their families i mean that is, you know, there's a lot of cool stuff and it's a great brand and there's a lot of great stuff going on and we're growing fast. The reason for all of it, if you ask Evan Hafer, you ask Matt Bess, you ask the founders and, and on our, our board and our C team and everyone and everyone at the company is that um, the dollars we're making, the productivity we're getting in logistics uh, and the revenue we're getting from uh, everything, all the great things that are going on with coffee and Walmart and, and ready to drink it across the country and all the C, C stores and uh, uh, grocery stores that it's coming out in. It's it's all to support veterans and their families and first responders and their families. We do a ton of work. You can go to brccfund.org. You can see all the work that um, Black Rifle Coffee Company is doing to support veterans and their families. And I just wanted to make sure that uh, you know we're talking about that as well. Well, you did an amazing job. I got to give you a little cowbell and the team over there. I appreciate your service. I appreciate the team service. I appreciate what you're doing for veterans. You're putting together this cool coffee brand. Everyone go to Black Rifle Coffee Club and, uh, you know, go and sign up. Get some ship to your house. Go check out their YouTube channel. Go support sure. some ver veterans. Ben, one more time, thanks so much for coming on the show today. I appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me, Junior. I love it. Love Take care, sir. Good time. Take care. Good time. Bye. Ben's a great dude. He came over to our corporate retreat a couple weeks ago, and he gave us a little feedback on what he thinks we're doing well and what we're not doing well. Actually, someone asked him there which shows he watched. He didn't mention Want the Truck, but maybe after this episode, he'll become a, uh, a regular subscriber. He's looking good. Smile. Ben, I love your smile, by the way. <laughs> Anyways, next thing right over here. So hopefully we don't need Ben or any of these soldiers, but take a look at where the doomsday clock is set at. The members of the Science and Security Board move the hands of the doomsday clock forward largely, though not exclusively, because of the mounting dangers in the war in Ukraine. We move the clock forward the closest it has ever been to midnight. 
It is now 90 seconds to midnight. <laughs> Sorry, I don't, I don't mean to laugh, but like this looks like it could have been filmed in 1970 and re-aired now. Like you got your science project there. You took a sheet off it. You think you did something. Um, Robbie Starbucks says, think about how incredibly silly this is. Some rich people have too much time in their hands. They actually spend money on this doomsday clock fantasy. What is the doomsday clock, though? I was curious. Like, what is going on here? Apparently, it's been or it's, a, it's the bulletin of atomic scientists. They all get together. They've been doing this since 1947. And I guess the significance of this little clock here is that that is the soonest to midnight it's ever been. So I guess kiss your loved ones. Not sure we're getting nuked, though. Um, speaking of loved ones, this is awful. Roll this video right here. Here's a boy that got stuck inside a shipping container. He was playing hide and seek gets loaded on a ship and ends up uh, over on a trip. It says right here in the India Times, on January 17th, when loading containers off a Bangladeshi vessel, Malaysian port Klang staff were shocked to see this 15-year-old boy in there. They thought it was human trafficking at first. They weren't sure. He says, no, I was playing hide and seek. Somehow it got lifted up. Nobody could hear him. It was so dark in there. Nobody could hear him screaming when he was inside. It said he didn't have food or water. And, um... When he got out of he saw him shaking. He's recovering now. Fortunately, though, you know, uh, no harm done aside from like maybe the mental trauma of being locked inside a metal box for six days. That's awful. Um, when I was a kid, I remember like on Punky Brewster, they had this episode where they really wanted to warn kids not to go hide, like play hide and seek inside of refrigerators. And I remember that kind of stuck with me. So maybe when you get home, just tell your kids, happen to be at a port, don't go hiding in a shipping container. I know a lot of us in logistics have weird logistics uh, crap hanging around. If you get milk from Costco, you're probably wondering why it's shaped so weird, why it spills all over your counter. Well, Super Trucker over at Back to Truck Up says, Costco out there reinventing the wheel. Because of this design, they don't need crates when shipping pallets of milk. They just stack them on top of each other. Can't stand the design, but when you think of the scale they're shipping at, it's really impressive. And as you can see, they put it at the top over there. It allows all of these, uh, all these milk cans to stack on top of each other, make it a little bit easier to get to you. Although, I'm with them. I, I'm with him. I still think it's a... I still think it's annoying how you got to pour out of that bottle, but I guess it sends you because it makes those hot dogs still cheap. Um, you got a wedding reception coming up. I actually got some trolleys for mine back in the day, actually about a decade ago. It's almost happy anniversary, honey, in October. This group here, they got the limo, but what happened? The limo got canceled. So what do they do? They reach out to the nearest truck driver that they know. He says, you know what? I'll modify a trailer for you guys, and I'll bring you over to your wedding, and you're going to have a great time. As you can see, there's cash money. Money on the floor inside there. I don't know what they got into, but it looked like they had a good time. They got it done and they got to go out to the wedding. I'm not sure it's 100% legal or safe. Um, Tristan Rominger said, this is a legit Dukes of, the ha Dukes of Hazard episode where they had a casino in a trailer. Uh, my favorite uh, that it says for legal reasons, this did not drive on the road. Well, I think we clearly saw it did. 10 times better than the party bus nice, nice work. And uh, this, these guys know how to have a bad ass party. Cool, well, hey, let's see something get unloaded. Roll this tape. <laughs> How did that happen? That happened because of Joe. She said, stop, Joe. That was a 1974 cab over Freightliner. Put that in the museum. Don't let Joe drive it. No, things happen. I'm sure they got that fixed. Hey, guys, I got to head off to Vegas. I'm flying out to, uh, I got to stop in Chicago. Then I go over to Vegas. I'll be there tomorrow in, uh, in Vegas. Beautiful city. We'll be back Friday, though. No show Wednesday. will be a Friday. We got Sal Mercagliano. We've got uh, Troy Larkin from Cedar Brokers talking about the dark arts of duty drawback. That's a world I used to be in, so I can't wait to have that conversation. And then we got a trivia challenge. It's been a fight that's been uh, escalating for a long time internally. Now I'm going to bring it to you. Mario versus Back to Truck Cups editor BJ. They're going to go off with some trivia, some supply chain trivia. Find me on Twitter at Timmy Tuna. Subscribe to the show. Take care. Don't be a stranger.